Hello everyone, my name is The Fox. In this video, we're going to be talking about Strix Point, specifically the AI9 HX3070. This is AMD's latest APU that will be coming out very shortly, and I'll be able to test it hopefully pretty soon. Specifically the 365 and 370, which I'm hoping to take a look at between the two of them. Now, if you've been following me on Twitter and also previously, you have been known that I had been talking about how good the low wattage performance on Strix Point is going to be. And largely, even if you go back to my Xbox handheld video that I did, I was talking about the same thing. We could just put more GPU and just lower the GPU clock in a given amount of bandwidth and have really good low power performance. And that's pretty much where Strix Point is. And it really isn't even the design point of what AMD is trying to do. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Let's first go ahead and jump into the Anantech article before we start breaking down what's actually going on. What is very interesting to me is AMD is very much saying that they have fixed RDNA 3. So RDNA 3.5 has a few key features here that are making things a lot better. Now, when we take a look at the IGP side of RDNA 2 versus RDNA 3, really there wasn't any big of a difference. The only benefit we got was from going from 6400 MT to 7500 MT, and that's basically all we got. However, AMD is saying that they have improved a number of things here, so let's go over them. So they've optimized for performance per watt, improved the performance and efficiency of many common graphics shader operations. That's pretty interesting. We'll have to get into a little bit more detail when we actually take a look at them side by side. But optimized for performance per bit. Access memory less often and more efficiently. This part right here is very interesting because when we take a look at Hawkpoint 8840U to Strix Point, they basically have effectively the same exact memory. So if RDNA 3.5 is boosting things specifically with being handling memory more efficiently and less often, that means that they're getting more work done inside of that same domain. So getting more work done in there, how much more, who knows, but that's still a benefit. So we have to see how well that actually tracks across different stuff. It'll be curious because when we take a look at the 365, that is going to more closely match 7840U and 8840U, both of those being 12CU wide. We could also just fluctuate a GPU clocks, which we're gonna show you in a little bit in this very video. Designed for better battery life, advanced power management in the GPU to save active power. This one is very interesting to me. If you've been following my channel for a while, you'll know that even going back to AMD Renoir, I have been modulating GPU clocks to more effectively get better performance on a platform. And I've been doing that all over, including RDNA 2. And that's what a lot of the auto TDP type of apps leverage. They leverage the same techniques that I was doing, but they're doing it against a frame rate. So they're doing that automatically, given that to try to really maximize how much power is going on inside of that. So maybe this also indicates AMD is able to start doing this. Fingers crossed here, because that's actually going to be pretty big news. Let's actually read the article. Much of the improvements over RDNA 3 come through several features that have been specially optimized for mobile platforms. This ensures that the Radeon 890M, which is the model with the Ryzen AI 300 series, has the best of both worlds in terms of efficiency and visual performance. The rate of texture sampling has been doubled which ensures double rate performance from the GPU. What it means on the surface is enhanced detail and clarity of the textures and graphics during gameplay. This, in theory, should help improve detailed textures so they look great when playing high resolution games. Further to this, RDNA 3.5 has 2x the interpolation and comparison rate, as vector ISA operations can work much better to bring out detail and high quality graphics. In this next paragraph, we're going to get into the meat of what's happening here. And now AMD is saying, performance per watt and they show a graph showing 15 watt performance against hawk point and indeed what we're looking at is strix point at 15 watt basically matching hawk point at 28 and 30 watt that is really huge that is a huge number to hit that inside of 15 watt meaning that strix point AI9 HX3070 is going to be a really baller handheld APU. More to the point, if we were to push more power into Strix Point, specifically the AI3070 APU, we're not going to get appreciably better performance. And in fact, because AMD is not even showing 28 watt performance, I would say that this is kind of concluding the same point that I've been saying for years now. In fact, this is the same thing that I've been saying back to when I was talking about how it's possible for an Xbox handheld to be possible. Because when we have such large GPU, we're really just memory bound. And as long as you can fluctuate memory, you can do a whole bunch of things inside of that giganto GPU. We're going to touch base more on that in actual examples in this video. I just want to touch base on one more thing in this particular article. In graphics workloads, the 3D Mark Time Spy and 3D Mark Night Raid, AMD claims that RDA 3.5 has an uplift of between 19 and 32% in terms of performance at 15 watt. At this point, let's pivot over to some real-world examples so that you can actually see what's going on. 
we're going to take a look at 937 megahertz and LPDDR5X, effectively 7,500 megatransfers, same as Strix Point is going to be. However, we're going to modulate the GPU clock from 2.7 gigahertz, 2.5, 2 gigahertz, 1.6 gigahertz, and more or less be able to see how memory bound we are on the GPU. Then I'm going to lower the memory clock to 533 megahertz, effectively 4266 megatransfers, and also modulate GPU clock so that we can see how memory bound we are inside of that scope. And you're also gonna, we're also gonna benchmark the memory itself and we're gonna see how fast the memory is between those two clock settings on the memory and give you a better idea of what's going on. And more to the point, why just pushing more frequency into a GPU isn't going to help us because the Strix Point AI3070 is a giganto GPU that goes up to 2.9 gigahertz, 16 CUs at 2.9 gigahertz. It is outrageously overpowered. It is just massively underfed via that memory. So let's get into that right now. I don't want to whip through this pretty quickly. You can see that I am using AMD's 8840U right here. My TDP cap is 45 watts and my RAM is set at 7,500 megatransfers. Now, if we go ahead and run this membench, we're going to see how fast we can run the RAM at. And we'll just basically be benchmarking that. So we're looking at 92 gigabytes a second. Generally speaking, that's how fast we're going. So it's faster than you'll find on other SODIMM laptop RAM, which is going to be around 70 gigabytes a second, which is what I tested previously on the B-Link Sur 8, which you can see right there. And there's a video I did where we overclocked the GPU and we saw that we weren't really able to get all that much performance if I were to overclock the GPU. You can see that we're kind of dialing down to about 81 gigabytes a second as we get closer to using all of the available RAM that is available to us on the system. So that's what we have right here at 7,500 megatransfers. So let's test what type of performance we can get at this particular RAM speed. All right, so here we are taking a look at Doom Eternal, and I'm not going to move from this just so we can have an easier compare. So you can see I'm fluctuating around 74 FPS right now. I am running the 8840U, which you can see right there, and I'll highlight this on the screen. I am running 1920 by 1080, so it's 1080p. And if you take a look at all the settings just by my, the side of my head right over here, all of them are in ultra settings. So I'm Kind of taxing the GPU as much as I can, but if we take a look up where the graph is, you can see that the GPU is steadily under that line. So that's basically just saying you're going to be above 60 FPS. So we're doing good there. That's our frame time graph. If you take a look over on our top left over there, you can see our CPU package power is 45 watts, which is again the TDP that I set as the max. Total system power, ignore right now. What you're looking at is that's from the BMC, the battery management controller. So I'm actually putting power into the system right now. So it's charging the battery and that's what you're seeing. If you take a look at our frame rate presented, it's matching up with what's going on up over there. If we take a look at our GPU clock, you can see it's fluctuating 2.5 gigahertz, 2.6 gigahertz. This is doing it automatically. If we take a look at our GPU memory clock, it's 937 megahertz or 7,500 megatransfers. So let's take a look at what happens when we just directly take control of the GPU. Let's just force it to 2.7 gigahertz. Okay, so now you can see that over there, my GPU clock is now locked in at 2.7 gigahertz, and we've actually lost some frame rate. And the reason for that is doing 2.7 gigahertz is uh, eclipsing how much power we're going to be using. So my package power isn't enough. At 45 watts, I'm actually robbing power away from the CPU and not able to facilitate that 2.7 gigahertz. So if I dial that down to about 2.5 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, let's see what happens. All right, so now I have locked in the GPU clock at 2.4 gigahertz. Notice our package power. We just dropped 10 watts. It's not really gonna go over 35 watts here. And the reason being is because we don't need that much power. Going from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.7 gigahertz on the GPU uses 10 more watts. So just 300 megahertz uses a substantial amount more power on the GPU. But you can see that if we take a look at our FPS, we're at 72 FPS. Basically the same exact thing that we were before when it was set automatic and using 45 watts. So we were effectively wasting power there. Let's see how far we can actually dial down the GPU before things get affected. Let's go down to two gigahertz. All right, so now we're at two gigahertz and you can see that our frame rate has dropped by about four FPS, generally speaking, right? We're kind of fluctuating at 68 FPS. However, take a look at our package power. We've dropped another 10 watts from going from 2.4 gigahertz to just 2 gigahertz. So that is a big thing that I want to try to communicate to you guys right here outside of just what's going to be going on being memory bandwidth bound. But because we have such a large amount of GPU on Strix Point, we don't even need that much clock, which means that we can use little clock but go spread across a lot of cores. 
and get a lot of GPU power while not having a lot of clock and spending a lot of power for that voltage to reach that clock. And that really is what I'm trying to communicate here during this entire thing, but we're going to experiment a little bit more just so you have a better understanding of what's going on. Let's lower the GPU clock down even further. Let's go down to 1.6 gigahertz. Okay, so now we're locked at 1.6 gigahertz. You can see it clear as day right over there. We're using, again, a little bit less power, but the difference in power shift isn't as large as going from 2 gigahertz to 2.4 gigahertz or to even 2.7 gigahertz. We're only saving around 5 watts now, going with a 400 megahertz reduction. As we go lower in clocks, we're going to get less and less benefit going lower. But we can see right here that we basically dropped 10 FPS at this particular frequency of RAM. So the next part of the experiment is we're going to lower the memory clock on this device, and then we're going to see how much GPU clock we need to satisfy that bandwidth. So let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. All right, so as you can see right here, all of my settings are exactly the same. My TDP is still 45 watt. However, I do have a RAM speed of 4266 megatransfers, effectively 533 megahertz, or around a 400 megahertz reduction on RAM. Let's go ahead and benchmark the RAM bandwidth and see what we get. So as you can see right here, we're effectively getting 56 gigabytes a second in bandwidth, a significant reduction, around 30 gigabytes a second less than running at 937 megahertz. So now the test is, let's see what happens when we run Doom Eternal in the same exact spot, see what type of reduction in FPS we get, still running at 2.7 gigahertz, and then slowly clocking the GPU clock down until we can find exactly where that memory wall is for that GPU clock. Okay, so here we are in the exact same spot, but you can see right over there, we're running at 533.3 megahertz on our RAM and we're running at 52 FPS, still with the GPU clock locked at 2.7 gigahertz. So we have a reduction of around 20 FPS here, just with the RAM frequency change all by itself. So let's go ahead and see how far we can clock down GPU clocks before we can get lower than 53 FPS. Okay, so we just lowered the GPU clock to 2 gigahertz, and you can see that we effectively lost 1 FPS. Nothing all that earth shattering. Let's see if we see a difference when we go down to 1.6 gigahertz. All right, so now I've locked in the GPU clock at 1.6 gigahertz, and you can see our FPS is basically 49 FPS. What we're seeing here is at 1.6 gigahertz on the GPU, we're still kind of in a good zone for how much we're being able to feed. So let's go ahead and lower down the GPU clock a little bit more and find out when we start seeing an appreciable reduction in FPS. Okay, so now we're locked at 1.4 gigahertz on the GPU, and we lost another 3 FPS. I still think that we have a little bit more that we can fudge down before we start noticing an appreciable difference in terms of how much GPU clock we need for memory frequency or memory bandwidth. So let's go ahead and jot it down just a little bit more. We've reduced the GPU clock to 1.2 gigahertz and we've once again gone down in frame rate a little bit. I think we're right now treading water with regard to our GPU frequency and how much memory bandwidth we are. They are in lockstep because every little bit that I'm going down, I'm now starting to lose FPS performance because I am just GPU bound in the situation as indicated by the graph up here. Now we've locked it at one gigahertz and you can see that our performance has gone down yet again. So we are now matching the clock with how much memory could be fed even when we downclock the memory. So right there, it looks like 1.9 gigahertz is the maximum GPU clock that we should ever be for 533.3 megahertz. Pushing more GPU clock in here doesn't get us any other performance whatsoever. So that is just a giant waste. And this really is the ceiling of power they should be doing. And we're looking at major diminishing returns really past 1.6 gigahertz. So hopefully I've been able to show to you how memory bound we are on this platform because Strix Point is an absolute GPU monster. Having 16 CUs at 2.9 gigahertz, RDNA 3.5 is going to have to fix a whole lot to improve on RDNA 3, which is 12 CUs at 2.7 gigahertz. And like I showed you in that video, pushing to 2.7 gigahertz is just a waste of power. In fact, going down 700 megahertz in clock really didn't change our performance at all at 937 megahertz at LPDDR5X or 7,500 megatransfers. So when we look at the same thing, going up to 2.9 gigahertz and 16 CUs inside of that same memory, what is RDNA 3.5 going to have to do to effectively do better? Maybe it'll be 7 to 10% better. I don't think it's going to be doing much more outside of that, given that, you know, what it has to work with. It's going to be pretty interesting to see when it actually comes out. But at the very least, we do know that at 15 watt, this thing's going to be a gigantic monster. Thank you very much to my YouTube channel members, as well as my Patreon members. Your support really means the world to me. I hope this video was informative. As always, guys, thank you for your time, and thanks for watching.